Hello, I'm going to do another follow-up on um, this frequency counter. The, uh, last time I, we looked at this, I've done a hard, mod a hard switch modification, which has been a hard power switch modification, which has been fantastic um, in use. Um, the next thing I wanted to do with this was calibrate it, and uh, I thought I'd, I'd um, give, that, give that a quick go because I weren't confident. I didn't have any confidence at all, at all actually, that this was calibrated. So, um, so I decided to. Uh, to just calibrate it. I don't have a reference, or I didn't have a reference at the time to calibrate it against. So what I decided to do was calibrate it against this counter. Now this counter I've had for quite a long time and I have a high degree of confidence. I don't know if that confidence is misplaced. Uh, what part of the purpose of this video is to find that out. But I've always always felt this, is, you know, I had a high degree of confidence this counter works, it triggers well, um, and it's, it's accurate. Uh, now I don't know how true that is, and, and we'll see today whether that's borne out or not. But um, what I thought I would do is um, do just just calibrate this to that um, frequency counter. And in doing that, um, this is shipped with the standard oscillator that comes with the system and um, it comes with it by default. And there's a little trim trimmer cap inside there that you can trim. And uh, in doing that, uh, trying to trim that, all that actually happened is the cap inside just broke up into a whole bunch of parts and it ended up floating around. And I think all the bits have fallen out now because I've shaken it around a bit. But uh, there's a piece of it right there. Um, so really disappointing. You know, for something that costs a uh, uh, over a thousand pounds new when it came out of HP, to have, a, have an oscillator that is so absolutely poor. And I guess like everything Agilent, everything's an option, everything's an expensive option. And uh, you know, you've got to really pay real bucks to, um, to, to get, to get the, uh, the good stuff as it were. So I thought the simplest thing to do then is to go on eBay and see if I can find the option for this. Now the option I think, I believe is called 53131A-010. And uh, that's a high stability uh, crystal os oscillator. So I thought I'd go and find one of those and just buy that. And actually, those appear to be very rare and um, not actually that easily available. So, um, so I was kind of a bit stuck there. I thought, well, I can wait around, I can wait around, or perhaps I can um, um, do something myself. So I, I, I've been thinking about for a while, perhaps getting one of those uh, rubidium um, frequency standards. And I thought that um, it would be good to, sorry, I was just, just picking one up here so I can show you to order, order one off eBay and uh, maybe I could take this, and this is the one I ordered, and I'll talk about it in a second, and uh, actually fit it into the, into the counter. So at least I've got somewhere convenient um, and, I, and I can then use the reference out possibly uh, to reference the other meters. Anyway, I got this and um, I powered it up. And as soon as I powered it up, I realized that actually, and left it on running for a few minutes, I, I realized that I wouldn't want to put this inside that counter because it's actually, this consumes quite a lot of power. Uh, a good few watts, about seven or eight watts when it's running, and um, it gets quite hot and all the rest of it, as you know, perhaps as you would expect, but uh, but that's the case. Anyway, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the story about this because um, I found when I was looking for these, it was pretty straightforward. I went to, went on eBay, looked for rubidium standard, found a whole bunch of them, varying prices, but somewhere around the fifty or sixty pounds mark. Uh, this one was marked uh, with the title um, ten megahertz um, reference uh, frequency reference. 60 pounds, I think it was. So I paid the 60 pounds or I made an offer for 58 pounds or whatever it was, I can't, I can't remember exactly. Anyway, I bought it and it was sent and that, that was great. So I took the information off the website and um, off their seller site and I powered this, powered this one up. It powered up. Um, there's, a, there's a lock signal that comes um, from it. And uh, after a few minutes of it being on, it locked, which was good. But I got no output. I got no uh, 10 megahertz output. So I sent a message back to the seller explaining this and they sent me some more information which actually instructed me to take it apart and have a look inside and do stuff. And um, basically this ends up being, it's actually not the right type and it turns out that there are actually different types of these. Um, there are ones that output one pulse per second, which is what this one is. There are ones that have got a programmable output, which are I think something different to this. And then there are other ones that give you 10 megahertz out. And then of the ones that give you 10 megahertz out, there are some that give it out on this here, and there are some that seem to have a, a coax output on them as well. So there's lots of variations. And the very odd thing about all of that is that all of those have the same part number, which is um, the uh, FE, um, uh, 5680A. FE 5680A. So buyer beware, be really careful when you buy these to make sure what you're actually buying is the right one. Now, 
one of the things I wanted to cover in this video a little bit was to try and give you some initial pointers, and I want to tell you the rest of the story because um, the um, in in discovering this, uh, and then the seller um, sent me uh, information, uh, and it looks like now when I opened this up and uh, followed the instructions, and there's meant to be a wire modification which was already done in here. Um, there is an eight point, I think it's eight point three or eight point six. I can't remember the frequency now. Um, reference in there and that is actually working so it is oscillating and it's locking and so there's a stable reference in there and there's a DDS chip in there which you can program there's a little microcontroller and there's a header which you can connect serial interface to and program and this is what those instructions were but you know at that point I was thinking you know I spent a couple of hours on this I've looked at this I actually bought this because I wanted a 10 megahertz reference so I could work on my frequency count I weren't really interested in getting into the nuances of reprogramming these things and the information isn't that available I use a Mac and the software seems to be, there's some, some people put some software together and it seems to be written in, I think, VB or something. So it needs Windows to run on and you know, it all got very, very hard. So anyway, I wrote back to the uh, seller and I have to say the seller was absolutely outstanding. And it's really nice to see that on eBay. I mean, you, people do get stung and it, it is difficult. And I was fully expecting them really to say, well, tough, you know, that's what you bought. That's what you've got. Uh, actually, um, they, were, they were excellent. And uh, I'll explain the situation. And also, not, not only uh, was this the wrong one, but according to their, the title and the item that they'd sold, but also the one pulse per second output wasn't working either. So it's actually broken. Apart from, so, so, you know, if it weren't difficult enough figuring out it was the wrong one, it was also broken. Anyway, the, 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 the seller was great. Now, the, I'll, I, I did say I'll mention the seller because I think, uh, you know, they, are, they do exemplify how good eBay seller should, should um, operate, and you'll see why this is in a while. I'll explain this to them, and they, they, they don't think about it. So the, the seller is called trade under, underscore spotting. Um, it's obviously a play on train spotting, trade, T-R-A-D-E. And uh, their responses were excellent. Uh, what they said to me was, look, you know, obviously you've bought, you, you, you've, we've sent you something different to what you thought you were buying, we'll just send you another one. And uh, hang on to that one, you can do what you like with it. And I'll come on to that in a second. So, um, so, I, so that, that was really great. And they, um, they sent me this one. Now this one is visually quite a lot different to that one. That despite having the same part number, you can see FE, 5680A, they both have the same part number, they both look the same from a connectivity point of view, there's very little difference in them apart from the labelling, um, and this one is the 10 megahertz reference, so this is the one that will give you 10 megahertz out on pin 6 or 7, I can't remember, it's one or the other. Um, so fantastic, so I got this one, I powered it up, um, immediately on the scope I could see, yep, yeah, there's 10 megahertz there or thereabouts coming out, and the lock, the lock signal which is high, there's a pin on here which, which is a lock signal, it tells you when the, when the rubidium, when the physics package inside has got to the temperature and the phase out loop in here is, is locked to the atomic um, frequency reference that, uh, that it's looking at, and uh, it never locked. It just carried on and I, I left it for half an hour, 45 minutes, at which point I thought, okay, there's definitely something wrong with this because this one locks in about two or three minutes. Um, now, th at this point, I'm starting to think, okay, I'm going to go back to the seller again and I'm going to explain to them, look, the second one doesn't work. And even I'm starting to feel guilty about this. And really, I'm the buyer. I shouldn't, but I was thinking, oh, you know, they've been so nice. They sent me this one. And uh, one of the things that actually happened, it was not packaged that well as it happens. And uh, it, it added a drop through the letter bo box here. Uh, this corner was all bent around. I mean, it didn't look like it had damaged apart from just bending that. And that's not that difficult to do. And these are quite heavy. Uh, anyway, they were really excellent. I said, look, all right, that's and, and what I've done is I put a short video together and just showed them what, uh, what I've done because they might, may have been thinking, oh God, at this point, you know, that guy's just an idiot. You know, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's damaging or whatever. So I put a short video together and uh, I didn't publish it, but I just sent it to the supplier and, uh, and, or the seller and let them have a look. They immediately responded and said, look, you know, these things do not work. They, they are secondhand, so they don't work sometimes. That's the thing to remember. These are all coming out of um, X, X equipment, um, you know, GPS towers, that sort of stuff. Um, so they just said, you know what, let's just send you another one. So here it is. So I got my third one. Now, the third one looks almost identical. Well, in fact, it looks identical to the second one. So there's a pretty strong indicator there that if, if, you, if you're buying one of these and it looks exactly like this, i.e. the big label at the top with the big um, part number, FE5680A, uh, right across the top there in big bold writing, and then a smaller label at the bottom, 
uh, with a barcode on it, the odds are very high that that is the 10 megahertz reference out one. And um, you know, the, they tend to charge a little bit more for these. To be fair, these can go for up to you know $100, $120 sometimes. You can get them for 60 or 70 if you look around, but they they're often a little bit more expensive. Um, just just so just bear that in mind. But that you know, as I say, visually they're quite different. So that's the that's the one pulse per second output. And I'm going to tell you something else about that. I'll just come back to that in a second. So anyway, sent me this third one, and uh, sort of with, with some intrepidation, I simply you know plugged this one in, powered it up, crossed my fingers, and voila, it worked. So it locked within about a minute and a half or two minutes. I got 10 megahertz out, and finally I've got my reference. As you can see, I haven't had to open it. This is uh, this is as it as uh, as I received it, and it works. So, and, and actually, when they delivered this one, I made sure I was here. So, um, so they could give it to me in my hand and they didn't drop it into the letterbox. Um, so I got my, my frequency standard and we'll come on to using that in a second. Um, what I thought would be useful just at this point, uh, now the seller said to me, you know, those other two you've got, hang on to them. Because um, I, I, I sent them a reference to my blog and said, like, you know, I'd do a teardown and repair on these. I said, yeah, sure, hang on to them, do what you like with them. Uh, obviously they're broken, you know, we, we trust you and all the rest of it, which was great. So I'm going to hang on to them. And uh, the plan is I'm going to I'm going to take these two apart um, on a separate video, and it will be a separate video because I won't have time to do it now. And I'm going to talk about the differences that I find inside, um, the differences in the connect the ping connections and what, what to expect. And most importantly, the, the physical differences to help you, if you're looking at buying one of these, to try identify early on which type you've got or which type you're buying. And um, apart from the visual difference on the front plate here, there's one, other no there's one other difference I noticed. When I took this one apart under their instruction uh, to have a look, um, I was able to take, remove the top. So you can, you can take the screws, the, the screws off here and the screws here and here. Uh, so I was able to do that and you can remove the top here and expose all the electronics. But actually on this type, this is the 10 megahertz output type, you can also simply remove these two screws and remove the back plate, and that exposes the underside of the, all the electronics and the components. And that, that was really easy. So, so that, that works on that one. However, on this one, this is the, uh, sorry, on this one, this is the one pulse, um, one pulse per second one, the wrong one, the first one that I received. When I originally opened it, I took the top off. That was, that was the way I'd opened it. But uh, actually, having received the other one and taken that apart, I don't, then tried to remove the bottom plate of this, and actually it wouldn't come apart. And there is a big difference between these two. If you look at the bottom, uh, the, one, the one here, you can see that there's all these um, small solder dimples, what they look like solder dimples. And I believe, I haven't, haven't really tried to take this apart yet, and I'll do that on video so other people can see, but from what I can tell is the board seems to be soldered through um, some kind of through through hole wiring onto this base plate. So it's actually a permanent fixture on here. And I think that's that's a good visual difference. Um, and I don't I don't I'm not sure if it's soldered or if it's welded internally. Um, I haven't really looked at too much detail. What I can tell you is if you remove these two screws and try and remove this base plate, uh, you can't. It takes an awful lot of pressure and you, you just can't. And I haven't looked inside to see why that is. I thought they were all constructed like that when I first took this apart until I received these ones that, that aren't. So there's, there's a big difference between those two. So those, um, just for, the, for, for now, just as a, as a short visual aid, um, to the two big differences, um, the, one, the one here that I'm holding in my hand is the one, parts, uh, one, part, uh, one pulse per second one, the one that you don't really want if you're looking for a 10 meg reference. And uh, you know, not only do they look different here um, on the front, they don't have the big label with the big part number. They've also got these kind of weird-looking dimples at the back, and that might be useful if you're if you're buying these. Anyway, um, for the for the remainder of this video, what I thought I would do, um, having having powered this up and found, real, thought, okay, right now I've got a real reference. Now I've got something to actually work with because up until this point I didn't have. Uh, 10 megahertz reference or any kind of reference that I could actually really trust. Now I've got this one. Now this is obviously second hand, it hasn't been calibrated in God knows how many years and who knows, but according to the spec, even with the aging specs, this is going to be pretty damn close and probably very, very you know, perfect for what I need. I, I don't really need any accuracy beyond this, so that's what I'm going to stick with. Um, so what I thought I'd do, um, have, having powered this up originally when I, to test it when I received it, I realised you know it takes too much power, it gets too hot, it's not going to be right to go in here. So uh, what I decided to do, um, because I couldn't, oh, I nearly dropped that one there, because I couldn't um, 
Let me see if I can find it. Because I couldn't find the 010 option for, um, for the um, uh, frequency counter here, uh, what I've done instead is I bought one of these. Well, I don't know how well you'll see this. Let me just uh, bring that in. Um, so that's a, it's an oven controlled crystal um, uh, oven controlled crystal oscillator set 10 megahertz. Um, one of various types. I, I, I don't know why I picked this particular one in browsing. There's a whole bunch of them on on eBay. Uh, this was about twenty dollars or twenty two dollars, something like that. Um, I you know the spec sheet looks really good for it, but again these are second hand, so you you know you never know. Um, the adjustment on these are done electronically, and, and that's one of the reasons why I bought this particular one. I don't know if they're all like that. I presume they are. But um, the 010 option that goes into the Agilent counter also have a small uh, DAC on it to control, to actually tune this. So I presume from the front menu you can calibrate it somehow once that option's in and enabled. And I haven't looked at that yet. Uh, just from what I could vaguely see on the schematic, and uh, the schematic in the manual is actually almost impossible to read, but you can you can pick out various bits of information. That's one of them. So my goal then is to either use this just as is and bodge it in there, or perhaps um, make a PCB for this, um, mount it properly in here, use the proper connector, and actually make a, a an OEM or a, or a second or a retrofit um, oven controlled crystal oscillator for the frequency counter. So that's what I'm going to try and do now. Setting all that aside, um, I think what I thought would be interesting for, for this video now is to um, take this and take this working one and compare them. So power them up, have a look at the different power, um, the, the power they draw, the kind of temperatures they get to, um, have a look at the frequency output and the frequency stability and just see how close these are. Because if I make the assumption for the purpose of this that this one is my reference and this one is the one I'm going to trust, then I want to see how close I can get this thing to this thing. And uh, if, there's any, if there's anywhere near, if I can get them anywhere near each other, then obviously this will be a very, very good upgrade for this counter. Um, the second thing I wanted to do was, um, <coughs> in, in doing this, is also when I'm looking at these references, uh, again, assuming I can trust this one, uh, is I want to, I want to, oh God, I keep on dropping that bloody thing. Excuse me. Um, it's one of the broken ones, so I'm not putting the, uh, the working one somewhere where it's going to fall off. Um, this one I've had a lot of confidence in, this frequency counter, um, and uh, it's, I've used it for, for a long time. Uh, I feel like it's accurate. I don't know why that is. I can't substantiate that because I've never compared it. I've never had it calibrated. In fact, the calibration steel, seal on the back of it is um, broken and when I first received when I first got this I had a quick look inside that doesn't look like as an oven control oscillator it just looks like a small oscillator block inside and I'll, I'll probably do a tear down on this because I've got to repair the front panel uh, in Johnson which is uh, one of the blogs on my um, video blog site you'll see is a reference he's actually repaired one of these and fixed all these buttons these buttons get really manky and horrible and they don't have any uh, positive action they just feel really soggy and stiff um, and this is this uh, common fault on these things. But nonetheless, that aside, this actually works quite well. So um, with the two counters here, I'm going to power up the, um, the two references. Uh, we'll do them individually. We'll check them on the counters, have a look at them on the scope, and then see how the whole thing, um, uh, see, see how accurate and how close they are together. Um, that, that'll, be the, that, that'll be what I'm doing at this video at this point in time. And then I'll, I'll um, follow up with another video on uh, actually tearing the... Uh, or taking these uh, the broken ones apart and seeing what we can learn about them. Okay, so I'm going to get myself set up. The first thing I'm going to do is um, get this one powered up. And um, um, one, one thing I wanted to actually, is, there is one other thing I wanted to point out uh, differences, and this might be another clue. <coughs> In order to get this one to work, this is the one pulse per second one. Uh, it doesn't require a 5 volt supply, a simple 15 volt supply, and this one works. In fact, the, 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 the pin that's meant to have 5 volts on it doesn't seem to do anything. However, on this one, which is the 10 megahertz output, it actually does need two supplies. It needs a 15 volt supply and a 5 volt supply. And what I've, um, what I've done, uh, if I can find it, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, but what I've done is I've used a simple external regulator. Um, so let me go now and get these up. Oh, in fact, there it is. <coughs> I've just used a simple uh, switching regulator 
um, connected up, and I'll talk about the connections in a second. Uh, and that's that's taking the 15 volt supply that I'm I'm feeding it and generating the 5 volt supply. And actually, um, I'm not 100% sure, but from what I can recall, there's probably enough room for me to fit that inside the uh, inside the reference. So once I've got it all working, I may well look to take the working one apart and fit this inside, so I don't have to have. Uh, to external supplies, but that's that again. That'll be a, a separate video. I'll deal with that. Okay, so I'm going to go away now and get these get this set up. This first one set up, and then I'll get back on camera and we could look look at the uh, power characteristics of the um, of the working uh, rubidium reference. Okay, so I simply use the um, the connector that came came with it um, when I removed this off the base PCB board that it, that it came on. Uh, the pinouts are really straightforward. Um, pin one. Uh, now the color coding is as per the resistor color code. So brown for one, red for two, orange for three, yellow for four, green for five, etc. So really easy to to understand the the colors there. Um, so pin one is the 15 volt supply, and I've got that. Uh, obviously going into, into pin one here. I've also got it going to the input side of this regulator. This regulator I've pre-configured to uh, um, give me an output of five volts um, on this red wire here. So pin one is our 15 volt input and also going to the regulator. Pin two, which is the red wire, is our ground uh, reference for the um, for the rubidium. That's also going to the ground reference of this power supply and uh, I'll give it power in a second. Uh, pin three is the lock um, detect output or the, the lock indication output. So the lock output is high um, when you switch it on cold and when it locks it goes low. Now you can power an LED from this. Um, I'm not sure if I'll bother doing that because they do. I haven't checked the um, uh, I haven't checked the um, the current that this can actually sync um, but uh, you, you can actually, I, I, I might actually, I might hook that up in a second. I'll, I'll put an LED on here because it'll be easier than seeing it on the scope. Actually, I'll, I'll do that. I'll use a low current LED. I'm sure that'll be fine. So that goes low when, um, when the, the rubidium um, has, has, has when, it, when this is locked to the rubidium physics package inside. Uh, pin four is five volts. Now it does actually need this. It doesn't work without the five volt supply, which is why I've got this set up. And I did find an article on, a, on, um, somewhere which I'll try and again I'll put the reference into the blog article um, where someone had figured out that actually in these things there's there's an unpopulated area of the P PCB board on the underside of it um, in here that allows you to create a switch mode a 5 volt switch mode power supply um, that, that removes the need to have this 5 volts in fact it'll deliver 5 volts out I believe um, and that might be a worthwhile mod to look at doing uh, rather than trying to graft this into the insides of this thing uh, but anyway, that's that's the, so five volts is needed. Uh, pin five is a second ground. I've, I've I don't need to connect that. Um, pin six and uh, I can't remember which way around it is. Now we'll have a look on the scope in a second. But pin pin six is I think pin six is the ten megahertz output, and uh, pin seven is meant to be the one pulse per second output. So that's what it's uh, like, and it's got to run at fifteen volts. So I'm going to use uh, HP on these uh, supplies here. Let me just get the camera organized so we can see okay so I'm going to use this supply here um, I know I know um, the uh, the initial startup is um, a fairly heavy current wise so I'll just connect these connect these up here okay so we're going to dial up um, oh and I'm going to get the scope uh, and I'll, I'll bring this into view in a second. Get the scope on pin six. Okay. I'm also going to. I'm just going to go and fit an. Let me. Um, I'm just going to go. I'll come off camera because I'm sure you won't, won't want me to see. Uh, you won't want to watch me connecting an LED. That's not the most exciting thing in the world. So I'll, let, let me just do that, and then uh, I'll switch. I'll come back on the camera again. Okay, so we hooked up now. Um, I've got the um, scope on channel one uh, connected to the output of the rubidium um, uh, frequency standard. Now, I, said, I think I said earlier it was coming out on pin six. It actually comes out on pin seven. Um, I've also got the power, this power supply hooked up to drive it. So the things that are worth looking at here is when we power this up, the characteristic is it draws a lot, quite a lot of current, uh, about 1.6 amps. 
uh, to actually warm the thing up and that's basically running the internal heaters and the heaters have to get to quite a quite high temperature I don't, I don't know exactly what the temperature is maybe we can figure that out when we take it apart uh, and we can measure the physics package directly but it feels like about it feels like it'll burn you so maybe 70 80 degrees um, Celsius anyway um, if we watch the characteristics when we turn it on uh, you should see there's the current draw we can see we've got the the 10 megahertz output and um, we can see that current now if we watch that um, what will happen is that will start to um, uh, slowly lower down as it warms up uh, you can see it's starting to reduce now uh, and it'll eventually dive to about 600 milliamps which is or 700 milliamps which is where it settles uh, now it stays drawing quite a lot of high current uh, quite a lot of current one and a half amps for now what's that that's about 15 it's about 23 or 24 watts of, of power it's drawing um, until it gets to temperature and then it then it actually rapidly declines um, that's the characteristic um, I'm just going to move the camera again the other thing I've done um, is I've connected up that LED as I said I would um, so I'll keep it on here now and uh, we should see it lock up and when it locks um, that LED should come on I actually um, turned off the power because I wanted to show you one other thing actually, uh, it's probably easy to do. So I've also connected up both frequency counters because we're going to be checking these anyway. Um, it's currently powered off so, um, so what's coming out is, um, is just nonsense. Um, it's just, I think it's just picking up noise. Um, so now one, the other thing that happens is when this, uh, you, you know that when you first power this up you saw on the scope you immediately get an output. And then what happens is the electronics inside there effectively takes that output and it sweeps it from just below 10 megahertz to just above 10 megahertz and then it once it, so it sweeps it low to high and then it pauses for a little while then it sweeps high to low and I believe it locks once once it gets to the, that transition of high to low um, and um, you know at the point where it's ready it'll, it'll transition from high to low and at that point it'll lock when it when it finds its frequency so I thought it'd be interesting as well as seeing the lock LED here to see the watch the frequency count and see if we can observe that uh, while it's warming up so it's, it's currently warming up now so you can see here if we look at this counter it's uh, uh, sitting at the low point um, and you should see it start to sweep up above the high point uh, there you can see it not sure it'll get past 10 megahertz there you go it's, it's sweeping back down again now this counter takes some time before it's before it's stable um, as well both counters do really they should be left on, on for 30 minutes or so um, so what we'll do is we'll watch it now until it locks and then um, then we'll take it from there So it's locked right there, and uh, as you can see, if if um, if I'm taking that now, that uh, now you can see the LEDs on. I don't know if you, I don't know how easy it is to to see that, but uh, yeah, it's def definitely on. Um, so that's now in its locked state, and you can see now that this looks stable. So in both cases, it's sitting there. Now what I'm going to do <coughs> is I'm going to leave this sit here for about. Um, you you can actually on the power supply. I'm still observing that uh, it's still actually warming up if you if you look up here there you go you should see it's just just very just as I move the camera it's just come down it's working its way down and I think it stabilizes at somewhere around about where it is now about 750 60 milliamps something like that so that's the power that's the power consumption that, uh, that it draws and at that point you know this 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 package now is pretty hot um, again how would I compare it it's not hot enough that I can't keep my hand on it, but it's uncomfortable to do so. Uh, it's a bit like, uh, uh, you know, I've got, got the back of, back of my fingers on there. It's a bit like holding a really hot cup of tea, I guess, um, which is often a comparison I use. I guess I drink too much tea. Um, so, okay, so what I'm going to do now is going to leave all of this powder. I'm going to stop the camera. I'll leave the camera in exactly the same position. Speaking of tea, I'm going to exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to go and get myself a cup of tea. 
uh, maybe say hello to the kids for five minutes. Um, what I'm going to do is I'll leave this now, I'll let everything warm up um, for about 30 minutes or so, and uh, then at least we know everything's running at its, its right temperature because all this has all been powered up. And we'll have a look, see, and see what this, uh, what this looks like. So we've got a kind of base point, and once we've got that, then I'll, uh, I'll get this one powered up, and we'll get that one up looking at the scope, and we'll see what this one looks like. Okay, so I'll see you in uh, a wee while. Okay, so this is uh, uh, about 45 minutes warm up, and uh, you can see, um, obviously this, this is inaccurate. I knew that because the, uh, the trimmer cap on the oscillator was actually um, broken apart when I tried to trim it. This is still on its warm up cycle. I don't think it's quite gotten there yet, um, but I thought I'd show you this because um, this is it's taken quite a long time. This this stabilised. I it carried on reading this this reading uh, for quite some time now, for about twenty minutes or so. How, this hasn't really moved. This has continued to warm up. Now I don't know. It does doesn't have an oven controlled oscillator in here, so I'm not quite sure why it continuously uh, warms up. I'm going to let it stable, but as, uh, I'm going to let it stabilise. So we probably need to give it another. 10 or 15 minutes or so, uh, which I'll do. But I just wanted to show you that it's, it's gotten to, you know, this is a rubidium standard that this is reading. So assuming this is accurate, you know, this, this meter was made in the 80s, you know, really early 80s. And, uh, you know, that, that's why I've always sort of had a high degree of confidence. It always feels like it's, it's pretty spot on. And, uh, you know, you can't, really can't um, uh, complain too much about that. 10.0000000. So it's this, this is reading, you know, to, to one tenth of one hertz uh, off of this frequency standard. So assuming the frequency standard, as I say, is, is reliable, this sort of demonstrates uh, a, a lot about this, this counter. These are great counters. They don't go for that much money, and they do have this weird problem on the, um, on the front. I think I paid about £200 for this when I bought it. Um, this does have actually have an intermittent fault on it. Um, when it warms up, uh, if I if I push the mains cable around um, a lot at the back, it tends to lock up and then it won't reboot, and you have to give it a bit of a tap and stuff. So this is definitely in need of service. I've I've got to do something there. You can see it's got it's it's still creeping up there. So the oscillator is gradually gradually slowing down uh, ever so slightly fraction. Anyway, I'm going to give it another 15 or 20 minutes and just let it warm up and capture there. You can see there this is reading 10 10 on dead plus or minus uh, one tenth of a hertz. This is uh, 9999056. So uh, let's give it a li little while longer and see, then we can compare those two. So about another 30 minutes has passed and I'd say they're, they're both pretty much stabilized. They're really not moving that much at all now. Um, they were moving at different rates and uh, that, that was kind of a cross check for me because I wanted to make sure, although I know according to the specs these are stable, but I wanted to make sure, one of the things I was observing was to make sure that this wasn't drifting or this wasn't warming up and finding its um, frequency. Um, now, the, the way I've confirmed that is in observing these over the last hour, actually they've, they've drifted their reading at different rates. So as you can see, this, is, uh, this has gone uh, up by, um, when, I, when I checked it 20 minutes ago, this was bang on 10 and now it's 10, um, 10 megahertz plus 1.3 hertz. Uh, this one was reading 9990538, and this has gone up by 2 hertz. So, you know, you can see they're warming up um, at different rates. So, what that indicates is that the, <coughs> the drift that's being shown on the display is relating to these devices warming up and not a drift, not, not a change in, in drift here. Mostly, I mean, you know, obviously there still could be some drift here, but again, coming back to this point, these frequency. Uh, references are meant to be very stable, so because it's locked and because it's giving us something, um, you know, a stable output, I'm assuming that this is good. So, um, so I guess the next thing to do then is to hook up this. Um, so what I'm going to do um, now, this is this is quite quite simple. You've got um, uh, the, these are powered by 12 volts, and uh, the, the seller had, had actually written uh, so that's a 12 volt pin. That's a 10 megahertz out. Uh, that's the ground pin. And I think this is the voltage control pin. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to run this up without um, putting any voltage control on here. Uh, so all I need is 12 volts from, uh, from the supply. And I'm going to, let me just uh, reposition the camera for a second. I'm going to run it on uh, this supply over here. Let's just get that powered up. 
don't know if you can see, there's a bit glary there, so sorry about that. I'll, uh, I'll, uh, not much I can do about it because there's a, a window there, there's daylight, and uh, I can't really change change that too much. Let's just see if I can improve it, uh, maybe a little bit. Okay, so um, I'm going to power this up with uh, 12 volts. Okay, and uh, let me just get the scope into view here. Let me get the second channel turned on. Okay, so uh, simple connections, just literally the scope on the output. Um, so first things, I'm just going to, oh, let's just uh, put this on here. Okay. hooked up um, so we'll be able to see here the um, the output current uh, this is cold so it hasn't been powered up um, so it's going to come from cold we'll see the output current displayed here and we should see the output on the okay so we can see the output oh, sorry we can see the output here obviously those two things aren't in sync you can see the, um, the power that's been uh, drawn here, about um, 400 milliamps. Um, so we'll see, we'll let that warm up now and see how that, um, see how that fares. What I'm expecting to happen is as that uh, oven controlled oscillator warms up, I'm expecting it to start to get close so we can see the two, the two sources to be somewhere near the same. If that doesn't happen, that means that uh, one of the two of them's out. And again, I'll, well, I'll have to make the assumption that it'll be the, um, the oven controlled oscillator. Um, okay, so just so you can see how I've powered it up. That's all it is, simple as that. I've got plus or minus 12 volts going in. I've got the scope on the output. And remember, the, both of these are uh, re reading the output of the rubidium uh, standard. So let's just get this. There's two into view there. Okay, you can start to see um, some um, phase modulation now um, in the in the display. That wasn't there before. So this it's been uh, the crystal oscillator, the oven control crystal oscillator has been running for about five minutes now. So it's getting to the point where um, it's starting to you know obviously the the scope is triggering and locking on the first um, signal, which is coming from the rubidium um, frequency standard. This is the one coming from the oven controlled crystal oscillator. And uh, you can see as it's rising temperature. Um, now, unlike the rubidium, the, crystal, the oven controlled crystal oscillator isn't um, drawing, uh, isn't lowering its current draw. It's still drawing 0 0.48, uh, 0 uh, sorry, 480, or actually 490 milliamps, according to the power supply. So, um, so what it looks like now is that the oven controlled oscillator is starting to drift in towards the, um, the same frequency as the rubidium standard. It'll be interesting to see just how precise these two, two are and how well they lock, um, lock and get close to each other. Uh, just, just a note on this: in, in testing these, um, in testing these, um, uh, comparing two frequencies like this at 10 megahertz, to get this to slow down to anywhere near a point where you can you can compare the two side by side, um, you know, they and and to to lock and you know just drift um, slowly uh, across the screen. They have to be very 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 close, um, and we'll we'll see that as we 
uh, or I, I can't really see it on the monitor that I'm looking at or from the camera. When I look at the um, look at the screen now visually, I can just so you can just start to see that now. If you uh, uh, if you follow the um, the bottom um, waveform and just follow it with your eyes to the right, it, it will stabilize. It's just starting to stabilize visually now. Um, it's a lot clearer directly on the scope screen rather than through the monitor. But we can we can definitely see that. Uh, uh, so at the moment, the um, because it's travelling to the right, so I'm going to make sure I get this right now. I think the oscillator is running slower than the rubidium, and it's starting to, um, uh, and it's just slowly speeding up. Have I got that the right way around? Not sure. I'm sure someone will correct me if I've got that wrong, but I think that's the way around. It's one one way or the other. And there, there we can go. We can start to see now that uh, it's getting very, very close. Now, what, what the hope is, of course, is that um, this will get close um, and it will stabilise at some point uh, without me having to do anything else with it. Okay, very very close now. Within within one cycle per second, they're in sync, um, which is it's quite remarkable when you consider these are essentially two free running oscillators um, in in their own right. Now that's actually interesting. The um, having, having looked now, the crystal oscillator, the oven control crystal oscillator, has actually dropped the um, the current it was drawing from. I think it was 490 milliamps. I actually missed it. I didn't observe it. Uh, it's now only drawing 186 uh, milliamps. So actually, that could be um, a good way of sensing when um, when the oven is ready for for measurement use, which actually could be quite useful um, in the um, in, in the actual frequency, I don't, I, I'll have to look at the schematic and see if there's a way of um, telling the frequency counter that is ready effectively because that would be really useful. I'm not sure there is. Um, but so, assuming it's got to that point, um, that looks like it's pretty stable. Um, where well, we're probably out by two cycles, two cycles out of 10 million. So, um, so that's 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 pretty good. A twentieth of one hertz. Um, the two the two stand the, the two um, oscillators agree with themselves uh, within. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna let that run for another say. Given that's there, I'm gonna give it another five minutes. Then I'm gonna come back on camera. And uh, the next thing I want to try is I want to um, I want to put a variable voltage in on the um, the, the trimming um, input, and I want to see if I can. Um, uh, stabilize that. I'll, we'll, we'll see if it see if it stabilizes any further from where it is now, and then I'll, I'll come back. So, I um, think probably another five or ten minutes. Okay, so that's been running for um, uh, about another fifteen minutes from the last from the last cut. You can still see it's just drifting slowly forward. So, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to use a simple pot, um, and uh, I'm going to hook it up. Now, the uh, the OC the the oven control crystal oscillator has got two pins that I've yet to connect. <clears throat> One is the voltage, the control voltage, and another is a reference output. So I'm going to use the reference output across this potentiometer, and I'm going to use the centre pin to control the voltage, and just see if I can trim that off to stabilise it. <clears throat> and see, see where we get to. Obviously, using a <clears throat> using a potentiometer is not a particularly um, um, ideal way of doing this because um, this will have some temperature drift as well uh, but it'll just uh, prove the point so I've set it to about the midway point I'm just about to connect it now so you'll see on the scope trace up here as I connect it the effect okay so I'm about in the midway point I'm just going to uh, uh, just going to trim that so I'll take it take it to both extremes so this is right down to ground um, and then this is right up to the positive reference uh, coming out of the OCO. So somewhere around about in the middle, uh, which I'm just going to trim that off now. Mm. 
Okay. So that's uh, that's pretty good. Um, the reference voltage is about 7.7 .7 volts. According to the data sheet, it should be eight. Um, but uh, for some reason, if I just get this meter here so you can see that. Uh, I'll just measure that reference output. Actually, interestingly enough, yeah, 6.97. In fact, that was, uh, let me just uh, remove that 10K resistor. 7.7, um, .7. okay, so there's obviously quite a low impedance output. Well, I've, probably not I'm, I've probably not wired that up correctly, really. <coughs> but uh, we use it, I'll have to read the data. The data sheet's quite vague on the, on the, on the purpose of that. Um, it, ah, it says the load has got to be greater than 20K. Right. Okay. So now I've just read that on the data sheet. I've got it on. I've got it on the screen on my computer there. Let me just uh, change that. I've got a hundred k pot here, so let's go with that instead. Uh, should have read the data sheet first. I'm presuming the voltage control input is very low current. Okay. Okay. So that's using a hundred K pot. Let's just measure that <coughs> voltage again. Seven point six four. That's with the hundred k load. And uh, check it without it. Seven point seven four. So it's actually not a very stable reference. That it's not very high current output. Anyway, um, okay. So so you can see on the scope trace now. That's pretty pretty still. Um, so that's that's a pretty good. Uh, place to end up. So I'll leave that, um, I'll leave that running now for um, 10 minutes. I'm going to turn the sound off, but I'll leave the camera uh, going and see if uh, in speeding it up in edit, uh, we can actually see any drift there at all. I have to say though, <laughs> I'm really impressed that I can have two um, completely free running uh, oscillators. Um, at 10 megahertz and see them see, see them that rock solid next to each other. That's really quite remarkable. Uh, I never never thought uh, oven control crystal oscillators were quite that good. Um, there we go. We live we live and learn. Anyway, I'll turn the sound off, but I'll leave the camera running, and perhaps um, when we speed up, we might see some drift. Okay, so that was 10 minutes of, um, of it um, um, running in high speed. Um, obviously, we, I, I don't know what that drift looks like yet as I'm giving this commentary because I haven't looked at it in edit. Uh, but the drift is very, very subtle. Uh, but there's, def there's definitely, obviously, always going to be a drift. So I think the next thing I'm going to do, just bringing the camera back out here, is I'm going to reconfigure this setup very, ever so slightly because now we know that um, we've got... Uh, Rubidium standard. These are both coming from the Rubidium standard and we're measuring these frequency counters. What I'm going to do is I'm going to reconnect these to the back of the instruments into the external ref in. Um, in fact, what I'll do is I'll, is I'll connect to the back of this one first and measure itself and confirm that we just get exactly 10 megahertz because that's what should happen if the reference and the input are exactly the same. You should see it and it, this counter makes the assumption that, um, that the reference is 10 megahertz. Therefore, there should be absolutely no drift at all. It should be bang on 10 megahertz. Once we've done that, I'll run both of them off the rubidium um, by plugging these in, and then we can plug the OCXO into either one of those and have a look at the actual frequency. So I'll just uh, reconfigure that now, and I'll be back in one second. 
Okay, so this uh, this counter's now got the uh, rubidium uh, reference and feeding into the back of the instrument, into the external reference in. We can see that the display is showing, let me just uh, zoom in here. The display is now showing us that uh, it's got an external reference. Uh, we're reading the um, rubidium in and we've got 10 megahertz exactly. You can see it's um, absolutely rock solid, which is exactly what you'd expect. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna unplug that and I'm going to disconnect the second channel from the scope. This is actually coming from the OCXO. And uh, we're going to have a look at that and uh, measure. And as you can see, we're within, where are we? 10. We're in within one tenth of a, of a cycle on 10 megahertz, which is, hmm, that's, that's, where we go, one part in a million. 10 million point one point oh one point oh one parts per million uh, so that's pretty impressive um so that's that's what we're getting here um i'm just going to reconfigure it now and um connect the uh connect this up to the external reference and we'll just check this counter gives us a similar result okay this is now being also clocked from the the, the rubidium from the external reference so uh, this is and this is coming from the ocxo again and again um, this is reading within, where are we, one, two, three. This is, this is seeing within one tenth of one cycle. It's seeing uh, a difference there, so that's, uh, that's pretty good. Okay, so I thought, quite interesting. I'm really impressed with this thing. I, I, well, I'm assuming that the rubidium um, standard is, um, is anywhere near Accurate, this thing is really, really impressive. So I'm definitely gonna build something to get this into my um, HP frequency counter here. Um, I'm holding it now, it's, uh, it, once powered and once running, it, it draws about six watts. Um, so a little under six watts, about five and a half watts. And once it's uh, stabilized, it seems to drop down to about one and a half to one and three quarter watts. So not really that much power. It's exactly, obviously the right solution, much better than trying to uh, plant the rubidium standard into this box, which uh, is still running at about um, five, five, five or six watts. Um, really stable. I'm really, really impressed. I think so. What I'm going to try and do, they, I, I do have the schematic for the um, HP um, frequency counter, and I can see um, the basic layout. Although the detail, it looks like it's a scanning copy, and um, I can't quite see the detail of all the components. Not that I necessarily want to replicate it, but uh, I probably need some more detail. I need to do some guesswork around the actual signals. Um, it is clear what the, uh, the DAC chip is, so at least, at least from that point, the DAC chip is used um, to, trim, to, to trim and control this uh, from a calibration point of view. So I think I'm gonna actually try and design and make a, uh, a standalone board that can house one of these things uh, and have the support electronics around it to actually work with one of these um, uh, one of these and, and fit that in. So that'd be quite an interesting uh, simple project at least it gives me a, a stable reference as I say if I could buy one at a reasonable price I can't even find them they, they don't seem to be for, so, for sale I'll just put the option in there but uh, in the absence of that I can use this. So uh, so that's it um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it call it quits there um, for this video. Obviously the next video I will I will do a teardown on the the two broken um, rubidium standards that I've got and I will um, uh, I will, you know, have a look at the innards, and we'll see if we can program that up and uh, get it to uh, get it to do some, um, you know, get you know get, get some more information. So, uh, so anyone else wants to use these things, hopefully, I'll try. And, and I'll also I'll take all the resources that I found on the web because they seem to be all over the place, and I'll try and consolidate them down into one. Uh, one location. I'm not going to try and do a teardown and and just uh, and uh, describe how it all works. That's done. That's been done really well already, as I said before, by a couple of people. Dave Jones has done a good one uh, quite a while ago. Uh, I think Mike from uh, Mike's Electric Stuff has also uh, done a good teardown, a good detailed teardown. So I'm going to focus on trying to identify the differences between the, the the different types and also maybe look at the programming aspects and see if i can get some more clarity and so on around that okay so that's it if you uh, if you enjoyed the video if you thought it was useful please give it a thumbs up uh, thanks very much very much for watching and i will catch you next time bye